So what was that transition like coming out of the military and moving into that first true HR role? Surprisingly difficult. Why? Because um, I didn't know what I was getting into. And that's similar to what most of our veterans find today. Over 40% of veterans leave their first non-military non service job in the first year. Over 80% leave in two years. Now there's various studies that all kind of roughly support those things. Okay. And it's really because they get out into a world that they don't understand. Welcome back to yet another edition of Recruiter Fuel. My name is Steve Lois. I am your host. We come back to you every Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Today, I've got a special guest. Bill, thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here. So we've had a number of conversations around your background, and I want to actually start there because you're this odd duck. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I mean that in a very positive way. Thank you. First of all, you've got about a decade of service, military service. I do. Okay. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And then you transition to an HR role, and we've talked a bit about it, but I think it's going to be important for the viewers that are watching to understand who Bill Kiefer really is. Okay. So give us give us the synopsis, the short version of the background. I uh, started out my career in the military. I was a logistics officer in the Army. Um, I spent a fair amount of time out with light infantry divisions, out muddy boots, doing real work. Got you a were deployed all over the place, right? Yes, I managed to get around the world. Central okay. America, Somalia, I managed to get around the world and do some interesting things. So you saw some stuff that we just don't even get a chance to see on TV. Correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I went through a little family circumstance yep. uh, long into my career and decided it was time to come home and take care of my family. Uh, and that got me into the commercial world. I came to the HR world because I had an HR degree. So you got it in the military or where, where did the HR no. degree come from? University of Toledo. Okay. I did the ROTC thing at the uh, University of Toledo. Sure. So when I graduated from UT with my VBA, I also came out as a second lieutenant. Got it. Um, did the Army thing, fully intended to do an Army career. Circumstances change. Circumstances change. I thought, well, maybe it's time to use that college degree. Uh, move back home. It's where the family is in the general area. I had also taught graduate school for the Army. No kidding. I taught leadership and logistics at the Logistics Management College. Okay. So the HR learning and development training piece kind of seemed to fit. My first job out was doing economic development for the county I lived in. I quickly realized that while that's interesting, it really doesn't pay much. Um, and then I kept, kept my search going. Yeah. Uh, network, network, network. Somebody I networked with knew somebody that knew somebody that knew of a manager learning and development job at a transportation supply chain company. So completely out of military, but happens to be logistics, transportation, Correct. Correct. so forth. So what was that transition like coming out of the military and moving into that first HR, true HR role? Surprisingly difficult. Why? Because um, I didn't know what I was getting into. And that's similar to what most of our veterans find today. I came out fully confident in my abilities. I knew I had great experience. I had seen and done wondrous things. I was well-educated. I'm coming back to an area where I know the geography. Yeah. I'm coming home. And I was really confident that life was going to be great. Work was going to just <laughs> fall to my feet. And it was all going to be wonderful. And in fact, I'm just another candidate for jobs. In some cases, the military experience was very attractive to folks. In other cases, not so much. We can maybe talk a little bit yeah, about we're gonna, that later. Yeah, we're going to come back to that here in just yeah. a minute. So what I found is a, a great opportunity with a, uh, a, an organization that did supply chain transportation, air freight work. Okay. Um, very structured, uh, very organized. I had about 1,100 people, mostly part-time, that we needed to train on how to load and properly balance aircraft and manage, manage uh, uh, freight and do all kinds of great stuff. I started with them running the training facility in Toledo, Ohio and pretty quickly moved up and ran learning and development, HR, uh, strategic HR for yeah. the enterprise. Ultimately, we got bought by Deutsche Bahn, sure. the German railroad. I worked on the integration of all the people processes uh, for that. And in fact, had a great opportunity to speak at the Kaiser Bahnhof in Germany, uh, the Deutsche Bahn's learning center. Really? Yeah, uh, they loved how we did leader development. So and it was all leadership development stuff? That was all leadership yeah. development stuff. Okay. They loved how we went after it. It was a very organized, very effective process. And me, myself and the CHRO were asked to come over and uh, present how we did that work to the top 200 HR leaders in Deutsche Bahn. Fantastic. It was an amazing experience. I left there, uh, decided to move on to another organization, uh, wound up with Dana Yep. post-bankruptcy. And the task there was to kind of stand up talent management in a post-bankruptcy world. 
Um, so again, I'm standing up talent management work, um, and we had great success there. I was there about eight years. Ultimately, I was their head of uh, um, talent management for the enterprise and vice president of HR for the commercial vehicle group. Yeah, you had kind of a dual responsibility at that point. I did. Yeah. I did. Well, well, why all the success? Because in both roles, you had a fair amount of success. We've talked about it. What do you attribute that part of it to? Hard work, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a pretty practical guy. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks that will do a lot of good work, and it's not necessarily lined up with what the business wants or needs. They'll work hard, but they do a lot of work for the sake of the work itself. My focus is always on figuring out how we as HR, talent management, or any of the support functions are trying to advance and enable the business strategy. You know, at the end of the day, the companies exist to do whatever they're there to exist. So in essence, it's, it falls under the term talent optimization. It does. It does. That's kind of my catchphrase, it, optimizing it, 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 talent yep, capability. Yep. So at the end of the day, if, if, if the organization has a strategy to do X, Y, or Z, I always look at it through the lens of, do we have the right talent to do what we said we're going to do? Do you think most companies do that? I think most companies try to do it. Mm -hmm. I think there's varying degrees of rigor and success. I think um, a lot of companies do it very informally. Um, they kind of do a thumbnail sketch of, yeah, I think, you know, I know Johnny and he's a good guy, so it must be fine. Why do you think that is? Why is there not the rigor that you applied within Dana? I think there's a lot of reasons. I think, number one, um, the people component, while everybody says people are our most valuable asset, sure. dealing with people is kind of a kind of a hard thing to do. <laughs> it uh, can be. It's just easier to deal with finance and capability and processes and tools and this and that, um, as opposed to sitting down going, do we have the right people? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. We like them, so they must be right. Sure. Or I hired them, therefore they must be great. The other side of that is it's hard to look somebody in the face and go, you know what, your performance isn't as expected. Yeah, and here's, so, here's the measurement. And here's the measurement. And it's especially hard if you haven't started with some rigor and said, here's what's expected. You know, I often joke with folks, our business leaders, I said, you know, how, why are you surprised that Johnny or Sally weren't successful? You didn't tell them whether they were scoring home runs or touchdowns. Sure, they have no idea. They're working really hard, but we don't really know, they don't necessarily know What's the priority and how are we keeping score and how it, are we keeping track? It's like from the recruiting side, which is a lot of what we mm -hmm, do, right? Mm -hmm. we, ask, we ask a lot of our clients, you know, how do you measure success in this particular role? And I want actual numbers. Yes. And how many can't give me a number? Right. They, have, they have no idea how to really set, this is what I expect out of this role. This is how it's going to be measured. This is how often it's going to be measured. So the, employee, the candidate who becomes an employee now looks at it and goes, what, am I doing it good? Am I not right. doing it good? Just like you said. Right. And you think about that, the various functions that operate in, in most manufacturing or, or for-profit businesses, yeah. whether it's finance or operations or logistics, they, IT, they know that they have metrics. Yeah. We got to make this much money, this much margin, this much EBITDA, you know, whatever it is, we know what it is. But when you turn that to the people side of things and say, what's the metrics for people? Everybody kind of takes, not everybody, most people kind of choke on it a little bit and go, well, we're not really sure. They hadn't thought about it that way. They hadn't way. thought about yeah, it that right. way. That's right. Yeah, those are tough conversations to have with people. So, you know, we, we know what's expected and here's what it is. In order for you to be successful in this role, you must be able to deliver A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah. And we're going to know whether you do that because here's how we're measuring it and here's where we're going to give you feedback. That's right. And we're going to partner with you to cause you to be successful because in your success comes our success. I, I think it's on my board sitting behind one of these things here. It's got business strategy on, on the one side. It's and got it's got the people strategy on the other side. Yeah. And, and people often think about that just in terms of systems and tools and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the thing that brings it all together is the right people. In the Absolutely. It's right. Absolutely. You know, years ago, Jim Collins wrote the book, Good to Great. It's you on know, my counter back there. Yeah. His concept there is you got to have the, one of his concepts. You got to have the right people in the right seat on a bus, right? They got to know what they're supposed to do when they're sitting on the oh, bus yeah. too. Well, that's, that's why I say it's the right people in the right seat right. for the right manager on the right team driving the right performance. Yes. Comes, you just mentioned that key piece, the performance side of things. Absolutely. So after you spent how long again at Dana? Eight years. And then you've now <laughs> gone off to do your own thing. No, I, I uh, left Dana. Yep. I had some aging parents and I had to deal with yep. some different family issues, which by the way, if you're in transition and looking for work, remember you got a family. This is all part of life. Sure. So valuable time, I, I'm glad I took. Um, then I wound up as the head of talent manager for, for Amcor Rigid. That's Plastics right, we Amcor. talked about that. Spent a couple of years up there and then decided last year, I was in a place where it was time to go kind of fulfill a lifelong dream, start my own gig. And what are you doing now? I run an advisory firm, yep. um, and I focus in four key areas. 
The first key area is military veteran career transition, hiring and employment. And we can talk more about the details yep. of that later. The second bit is executive and leadership coaching. I'm certified Marshall Goldsmith uh, Stakeholder Center coach. The third bit is on the strategic talent management, much of the work we just described. Yep. And then the last piece is meeting facilitation and, and some public speaking. I do a fair amount of that. So those are the four primary areas I dabble in. So the, the one that I want to start with, mm -hmm. you, you and I have had a fair amount of conversation mm -hmm. on this, is this whole idea of veteran recruiting. Mm-hmm. And, and the way I think we started this, or when we first had that, when we first met, I said, you know, companies are always talking about, you guys are always talking about driving more veterans, hiring more veterans, whether you're Starbucks, Bank of America, doesn't matter who you are, right? Then you and I talk and you're like, veterans, and we have some here that work mm -hmm. for us, mm -hmm. they, they find it very difficult when transitioning out of the military, whether they've been in for two years, four years, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't really mm -hmm. make a difference. Mm -hmm. So to me, that doesn't make sense. One's looking for them. The other one is saying, I can't find a freaking job. What's the disconnect here? Yeah, I, I actually use a graphic in some of my work where I use a boiling ocean, you know, <laughs> rough seas. And on the one side, you've got the veterans standing there looking across the ocean going, I have wonderful capabilities that I need to bring to a great organization, but I've got this gigantic roiling sea in the way. Yeah. On the other shore, you've got the uh, employers looking across the ocean going, wow, this hiring top talent thing is tough. There's some really rough seas out there. Sure. Both great, well-intended uh, uh, people and in, in, in organizations, and neither one of them fully know how to get to the other. Yeah, that, ma so, that makes no sense to me, though. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. But how many things in society are like that? You <laughs> okay, know? fair. That's fair. what, you know, we have bridges. And part, you know, as I kind of developed the business, because uh, I started this last July, yep. as I developed the business and kind of the, 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 the mental model around it, really what I do is try to create a bridge a bridge to help those veterans get above that rough sea and get over to the employers, get seen, visible, and available to employers. And then on the other side, the bridge goes both ways, help uh, employers understand what's out there in terms of top talent and perhaps whether or not veterans are the right fit for their talent needs. So let's start on the veteran side. Sure. Because we, we had a vet, he's no longer here, but we had a vet that um, really kind of had a, a challenge. Can I ask how long he was here? He was here for three years. Okay, so he's not a statistic. That's good. Okay. Now he was the, the, he got out of the service, served okay. four years. Okay. Um, I think there was a medical discharge okay. after the four years. Basically took the first job that came his way, and he lasted about 11 months. Oh, he is a statistic. Months. Came Then came here after the fact. Okay. Um, now is doing some other things. Um, he's actually helping vets right good. now. Great. But I never quite understood the, the transition. I'm not a vet. Why is it so difficult when you get out of the military to really find that first job that sticks? Because to your statistic, I see it all the time. They last six months, they're gone. Yeah, the, it, I think it was Syracuse University and one of their uh, foundations did a study a couple years ago now. Yeah, over forty percent of veterans leave their first non non military service job in the first year. Over forty percent. Over eighty percent leave in two years. Now, there's various studies that all kind of roughly support those things. Okay, and it's really because they get out into a world that they don't understand. You know, they leave but, the. But they weren't always in the military. Correct. Well, the military is a strong acculturation. I get it. You know, basic training is, is there to do some 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 strong uh, uh, orientation, shall we say? Break you down, build you back up. Break you down, build you back up. Right. And it's important that they do that. You know, if you look at orientation in the military, basic training, officer-based training, whatever that, course training, whatever that happens to be, versus what you get in many companies, it's chalk and cheese. Sure. You know, so our veterans get very strongly acculturated to the military service, whatever branch that is. And that is a purpose-driven organization. What Air Force mission, Marine Corps mission, whatever those missions are, we are there to support that mission and everybody there. It's very clear how you fit what you do and what your purpose and mission is. Most of the folks that enter the service, because they're all volunteer forces now, there's no yeah. draft, hasn't been yeah. for years, tend to, whether they want to actually publicly admit it or not, have a high sense of service. Okay. Okay. So a lot of our veterans come into the military service, whether they have a great experience or not, whether it's a long-term uh, uh, employment or not, um, they find a sense of service there. They find a team. You know, veterans have, military members are trained not to talk about me. We talk about we. Yeah. We took care of the mission. We accomplished the Kind task. of those brothers in arms, so it, to speak. It is. No, no, it, not saying anything negative about females. Sisters in arms, too. Right, 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 right. But it's all about we because they recognize truly the value of the team. Yeah. And we see a huge difference in the commercial world. Well, there's 
maybe some instances of that, but it's not nearly as strong. It shows up even in interviews. You know, when, so. you, when you do an interview and you come in, and one of the typical questions starts with, tell me about a time when you, Yeah. and many of our veterans respond with, well, I'll tell you about a time when we, and the interviewer, a good interviewer will come back and say, no, 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 I didn't say we. You. You. Yeah. What did you do? The employer, it's understandable, the employer is hiring you. They're hiring the individual, not the team you were with. So the focus has to be on, what are you bringing to the table? Mm. I have work that needs to be done. I have expectations that need to be met. I'm looking at investing in you. Tell me about you. That's the one side of the C. The other side of the C is the veteran who has been acculturated to everything's about team and we. And they're not instructed thoroughly enough. They're not exposed to this issue of, you got to talk about you now. Yeah. And they blow an interview. And in fact, I've had employers, you, some of you are probably watching this, that have come to me and said, that candidate bombed because every time I asked him or her a question, it wasn't about anything they did. It's about what the team did. I want to know what they did. It's really uh, amazing to me. How many times do we hear organizations say, we don't have enough teamwork? Sure. We're here to collaborate. We want to be together. And then they get candidates that come in and say, it's all about we. They go, well, like, oh, you didn't talk I, about you, you so <laughs> where, we don't want you. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Make your head spin. So that's the kind of discussions I like to have with veterans and I like to have with employers, formally or informally, to say, what do you really want? Do you want to be collaborative? Do you want teamwork? I don't think there's an employer out there that would say, we don't need better teamwork. Yeah. We are collaborative. You know, we everybody gets along here and it's wonderful. But then sometimes the interview veterans that come in with that great sense of collaboration and team, they go, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't describe what you did. Therefore, we're not going to hire you. How, how many times when something like that happens and you're consulting with your clients and mm -hmm. you ask them the question, you know, do you really want team or do you want individual? How many times have they said, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, more than I'd like to <laughs> share. Yeah, I would, I would guess so, right? It is, yeah. And, you know, I think all, all the employers out there are trying to do the right thing. You know, they either have stakeholders, shareholders, whatever, that they've got demands that they've got to meet. There's expectations they have to meet. And they get caught up in doing whatever that is. Sometimes they need a fresh set of eyes to come in and go, hey, wait a minute. You say you want collaboration. You say you want teamwork. You say you want agile, capable folks that are globally experienced. And now you've got one. And because they answered an I question with we, you don't want to bring them on the team. I, I don't get it. So I want to, I want to delve deeper into this here yeah. um, the next time we chat. Okay. I want to come back and talk uh, the second time a little bit more in depth about what do we do about this disconnect. Okay. But thank you for at least laying the foundation for this, this number one session, Bill. Glad to do I it. I appreciate it. it. See you guys in a week.